as a surprise, I thought today I'd talk about our design system. So we're going to, um, where we're heading to, where, um, where we come from, and a little bit about what I've learned along the way. So look at these fine gentlemen and ladies. Um, HSBC is a bit different from the average, the average startup. So it's 150 years old. Um, these guys here, they, um, they were signing the, um, the end of the American Civil War the same year that we started HSBC. And um, none of these guys were really thinking about design tokens and React libraries at that time. So it's a very different world. They didn't even have telephones. So, I mean, we complain about tooling. I, I don't know what they were worried about. Um, as you can see, it's a, it's a complicated business. It's, um, and and this, is a, this is just to show you how mad it is, really. Um, so it's big, it's complex. It's the world's biggest international bank. It's not the world's biggest bank, it's the world's biggest international bank. So it's um, 250,000 staff. I know you can read the slides, but 80 countries, huge revenues. We have all sorts of different customers. So we have, we have customers like Nike and Amazon that generally suffer with, um, with kind of quite uh, internal exp um, experiences. And we, we have to deal with, with your grandma at the same time. So we have to, we have to deal with a lot of stuff. So we have, we have um, when we talk about buy-in, it's quite, um, it's a different subject for us because we have lots of everything. We have lots of ideas, we have lots of innovation, we have lots of service design, we have lots of different models, lots of diversity, um, lots of consultants. But obviously, it leads to lots of fragmentation. And, wh and where my job comes into it, I'm, I look at how we can kind of bring those things together. So a little bit about me. I'm not a designer, so I don't come from a designer background, but I have spent my career working with creatives and developers. Um, and I do think that's a level of maturity that designs get into now, where it doesn't have to, you don't have to be heading to be a creative director or heading to be a um, technical director. I think there's, the, the design maturity is allowing more roles to be part of that. Um, um, so all, I think one of the most important skills I learned along the way is getting really good creative teams to do things, achieve things, developers, et cetera, without, without wanting to kill me. And that's kind of... What I do now, just at a larger scale, so I get people to try and contribute and add to a global design system at quite a large scale, and, um, and I get them to try not to kill me. So we've had a design system at HSBC probably in one kind of scrappy way or another probably for the last nine years. But two years ago, we went through a major rebrand for HSBC. You probably recognize a few logos changing here or there. So that was a great excuse, a great opportunity to relook at our whole design language, our design system, our values, our principles, et cetera, and kind of do a big, a big sweep. Um, I'm going to show you um, a short video that kind of does a, a good job in explaining how our design system works. I know it's a bit of a cheat, but it's two minutes long. Great design at HSBC starts well before we create a concept, place a pixel, or develop a delivery plan. HSBC's global digital design system was born out of the need for simplicity and modernity. It's a system whose purpose is to consistently guide our customers towards prosperity. It's made up of six components. Design language, a common and modular design language that aligns HSBC's brand to its brand foundations, design guidelines and implementation. Our system helps us solve the most complex design challenges in the financial world, but it's also easy to use. That's because it's evolved from strong foundations and been crafted by the hands and minds of people that'll use it. Community. A focal point for HSBC's design community that connects their creativity and experiences. Design thinking. A customer-centric model that guides the design process by defining key activities that ought to take place during a project. Review and alignment. Design operations that support teams and business lines to evolve digital assets in line with guidelines. Measurement and performance. Methodologies that help teams prove the effectiveness of products and designs using data, common analytic services and best practices. Tools. A common tool set that aligns HSBC's design community and practices while improving design output and efficiencies. 
HSBC's global digital design system is part of our design DNA and a signature of our customer commitment. It connects the tools our design community use and shapes every experience we serve our customers. Together, we thrive. So as a design system, we, I think we've talked about design systems all day and that's great, but it means different things to different people. You know, um, to us, we went for, a, when we started this journey about kind of two years, 18 months ago, we wanted a fully encapsulating design system that had kind of everything in the box, really. Your design language, your design thinking, your community, view and alignment. We kind of bring in a lot of areas together into one place, trying to create a common, common kind of tooling, a common way of working, a common currency that, that allowed us all to kind of know and also give authority to, to models so people know, know what they're using. And uh, we say design, language. We also have code involved, et cetera. And we're just launching a new platform now um, uh, in a couple of weeks, actually, that's going to have, um, that, that's based on AEM, and it has all of our, um, all, of, all of our patterns, or all of our code, like code-related items on there, allows us to download toolkits, et cetera. So it's going to be a pattern for our community. But what one interesting thing is, in this area, we deal with, we decided as a brand to bring all of the kind of large, above-the-line branding and all of the and all of the digital branding into one place to kind of create a consistency. And it's meant a big change in how we work together as, as a company. And it, and it brings a lot more authority to what, to what we're trying to achieve. What I want to talk about mostly is, um, is how we work together in a, in a large, large organization. Um, obviously, as, it, as the organization gets bigger, these things get harder and you're dealing with so many different countries, et cetera. Um, relationships, a lot of people spoke about relationships today. And, Literally, it's the most important thing, and it's the number one thing we worked on before we, before we did anything. From a relationship point of view, if you don't have one, you just can't get anything done. You can't deal with the politics. You can't deal with, um, you need to get people, you encourage people to be your advocates, to go out there and deal with it. We've got around 1,000 designers and UXers in, in our community, so in many, many different countries, so it's, a, it's a lot to deal with. And I think getting them to trust you and getting them to know that you're, you're there to help and you're not trying to build something yourself and you want to share the ownership of everyone is, is really important. One thing we learned quite early is that hierarchy is really important. And that doesn't sound like a, doesn't sound like a fashionable thing to say these days, but when you're, yeah, when you, when you're dealing with so many people and, 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 you're, and you're dealing with a very flat structure, it's very hard to make decisions and it's very... And it's very hard to make uh, a call on individual ways forward. So what we did is we created a, a network of creative leads where you would have different people in different areas that would really know their area. You'd be able to get 10, 15 people together, make decisions really fast. It meant that they felt bought into the system. It meant that you kind of get around the politics. And it meant that we can kind of function, function in a much better way. So we go for a... Um, a top-down, bottom-up effect is what, we, is what we talk about when it comes to creating our design language. So we roll big strategic changes um, and large kind of collaborate, collaborative efforts. We roll downwards from, from, from a high. And then we also have a constant evolution coming from the teams on the ground, working with mostly directly with the customers. So we, so we kind of work on two, two levels. From a, from a tooling point of view, yeah, tooling is really hard in a big company, and it's harder in a bank because, secure, because security is such a nightmare. And, when you're do, and, and the way tooling is working now, obviously, there's new things coming out every day. And we know that there's, there's whole new ways of working, there's, whole, there's, there's structures around it, et cetera. I mean, I spent many hours sitting with procurement and risk, and hopefully you guys don't have to deal with that, but sitting with them and trying to convince them that we need a new tool. I think it's like speaking to your dad. Like, if you, if you think back of... Your mum or your dad when you're 12 years old. And you say, Mom, Dad, I need this new Nintendo system. And they're like, what's wrong with the old one? You know, it doesn't play the latest games. And they're like, oh, it wasn't broken. You don't need a new one. So it's like that. And then, you know, like Mum and Dad, if you keep wearing them down, they fold, and then they get you in a new system. But I would say what we've learned over the last year um, for a lot of hard work is building the relationships with these kind of areas that are outside of design, like the people that actually really do pull the strings, pay the bills, let's, let you get the tools in, and it's really important. 
And thinking strategically about tooling is a big one because there's, there's, there's clever ways you can do it. You can, you can, you, you can get pre-agreements to types of tools and it means you can get the tools through really quickly. And that's things that we've learned through hard work. But it's also thinking, thinking a little bit differently. We have uh, sketch-based shared libraries like, like most of you guys have. Um, and, and we found that they were, before we kind of got involved from a design system team point of view, before I got involved, is these were kind of popping up everywhere. So everyone, start, everyone had their own little design system. You had um, a team putting together a couple of buttons, and then one guy really loves design systems, so he starts building one, and then there's like 20 of them. And then they start arguing about which one's which, which one's best. So what we wanted to do is create a common currency and a common structure for these toolkits that every team uses. But when we talk about decentralization, it was really important that it wasn't just the design system team that owned everything. because We kind of curate everything, work in a collaborative manner, but these toolkits and the code libraries that go with them are owned at a program level, so large kind of programs. They, these programs are the size of Monzo, probably bigger, but there's lots of them. And they, have a level of, and they have a level of ownership, which means they're maintained and they're kind of decentralized in a way that we also work really closely with them to keep the structure aligned, naming conventions, et cetera, but, but people have their own ownership. Before we had these kind of these sketch-based libraries um, that, that we held, we held them on cloud, we use abstract, you know, it works really well. Before we had that, um, even individual teams found it really, really hard to get organized. So it wasn't even a, a company thing, it was like a team thing. And when you've got teams spread out across the globe, and you're trying to get them to use the, all the same buttons, all the same kind of step trackers, et cetera. It's really hard because they can't even organize themselves like that. So, so having, having a centralized place um, really helped our teams get organized on an individual basis and then a global basis. The biggest challenge, and lots of people have talked about it already, but the biggest challenge we ever face is the ego, the human ego. And we all have one. You know, I'm standing on a stage right now, I've got a microphone, talking to you guys, live streaming. I have an ego. And it's really hard to, in, in the large companies, and probably any company really, it's really hard to make your own mark. And they find it really, people find it really hard to, to show their impact, to measure what they've achieved, et cetera. So, so it's very natural that you would, you would want to, you'd want to make something of your own and own something and then be able to put your name to it, et cetera. Which is, which, is, which is great, but it's really, really difficult if everyone did that on a huge scale. And one of my approaches to try and get around that is to encourage people to put down those kind of trivial individual ownerships and take a bigger ownership in a, in a large endeavor like a design system. To be able to contribute and to get credit and to be able to add to the system and get credit for, being, for, for having added to the system. That's kind of the only way around it, and it does work. Um, consistency. I, I like the way Sean mentioned um, coherency over consistency. I, I'd be pretty happy with coherency right now. Um, consistency is a big one for us. Uh, we spend a lot of time on consistency. I have to work really hard on it. Um, we have quite a hard uh, governance model. So, so what that means is that we have a central team that looks after from a, a looks after all digital products that go through. So they don't necessarily check every single product, but they have done in the past. But as we get more and more mature and we start signing off toolkits and more things more strategically, it means we don't have to check every individual thing. But still from a risk point of view, like HSBC have a free, um, a free step process, um, free lines of defense where basically you have the person that creates the work, someone that checks the work, and then you have like an auditing system at the, at the end. So it's, it's, um, it's really important from a risk point of view, from a reputational risk point of view. We deal with accessibility. We have, we have a really good accessibility team and we take it really, really seriously. So you're going to go through this whole process. And one of the, oh, you can't see, imagine there's a box there on the right. Um, one of the difficult things from an alignment point of view and a consistency point of view is you're always dealing with um, free time periods. You're dealing with legacy projects that have kind of slipped into the past. You're dealing with the majority of projects are today projects. Someone wants to use a system, they want to go live, they want to go live as fast as possible. And then you're dealing with future projects, future kind of exploration based projects that want to really push the envelope and try new things and really, uh, and really take us forward, which is what we need to kind of stay healthy. 
I mean, the problem happens when you have an ID crisis in a project and you start to, and you have, let's say, an ambitious, uh, an ambitious design team that um, are asked to deliver something like in two weeks' time or three months' time and they have no budget, they have no user testing, um, but they really want to do some future projects and they don't really want to test anything, they don't want to test new things, they just want to get it out the door, but they also want to break all the rules at the same time. So what, what they've got is a today project, but they imagine that they've got a future project. It's always hard because it kind of guarantees uh, fragmentation, even if it's better, it kind of creates, a, it creates damage. And the other way around as well. So you, uh, teams are given more freedom to have blue sky projects, to try new things, don't need the testing, don't need the accessibility because you're just doing conceptual work. Someone up high loves it, presses the button, gives them 200 developers, and then they want to roll out next week. And then that is also guaranteed fragmentation. So what we're looking for is a controlled system where future projects are always there to, to breathe life and, and bring, uh, bring evolution into it. Today, projects can move out really quickly because everyone gets what they need. And generally, when projects move into a legacy because we've moved on from a design system point of view and, you've, and your project is four years old and it's, it's failing now, we want, it, we want you to move back into the current. So it's kind of like that you're constantly, and, and being able to categorize like that allows you to have a different relationship with different types of teams that are doing different things. Something we're really keen on at the moment is, is looking at AI and automation and how we can give that, bring that into our design system in lots of different ways. Obviously, I don't have to tell you guys in the room, AI helps a lot when it comes to labor-intensive tasks, admin. We do a lot of documentation, reporting, measurement, basic support, um, things like communication, et cetera. It all takes time. It all takes time away from being creative. And we, at the moment, we're working on a number of projects to take away a lot of that kind of mundane stuff. Um, this is um, Robot Chicken, which is a current project we have going. And uh, this is based on, on one of the team. I won't say who it is. Um, the project we started about 12 months ago, and it's in conjunction with... Um, um, with a few different people, including Microsoft. And um, the tool started as a POC to see if we could use uh, machine learning and AI systems to conduct design reviews and allow designers across the globe. Some of them are using shared libraries, and that's good and must, much easier, but so many of our teams don't use shared libraries, don't use, don't use uh, standards, don't know about the standards, and it kind of and it helps a lot. So what you see here is, is just a test review. We're at MVP stage now, but what this has done is, is you've got a kind of Frankenstein page with a load of standards and a load of guidelines chucked on it, components, and what you've got here is a review with, I think, about seven, 700 recognitions of, of different components and different aspects of the design language. Now, what happens, I kind of mentioned, and I'll jump, I'll jump back to the slide when we talked about da, 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 this, and we talked about this human aspect, so this is... This, this takes a huge amount of time. So when someone uploads a piece of work to be reviewed, they could upload to Envision or send an email, uh, someone schedules a human review to happen on using, using Jira, using a project management tool. It takes about three or four days to get, to get to do the review. It could take a designer maybe two hours. I don't know, sometimes we get huge projects with 300 screens in, and that takes, takes half a day to review and do a massive report back and deal with all of that. It's, it's a huge task. Jump, 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 jump. Now this takes about eight seconds. This goes up. Um, so what it does is image recognition. I can't go into too much detail at the moment, but image recognition goes up, does a review on the cloud, and we get a report back, a detailed report that they also links through to all of our standards in specific areas and asks for specific changes. So we're at MVP stage now, and we're doing a big push over the next year to kind of get a really fully fledged system up and running, allows designers to do this themselves without having to get contact with a human. And one of the exciting things for me, apart from the fact that it really helps, is, is the amount of data and measurement we get from, from all of our designers and community using that tool globally, understanding what they're getting wrong, what we're getting wrong, and then, and then there's all sorts of opportunities that come up after that. So looking at design quality, being able to search by every project that's happening through. Because we deal with over a 1,000 projects a year. I think it might be a lot more than that, just for digital. But we've talked about projects as a journey or a feature, et cetera. Um, but being able to search by pattern, by user, by country, et cetera, 
it, it allows you to get huge amounts of data we can then build on and, and talk about live data and we can talk about performance and you know it's endless kind of ideas that are coming out of it. I think from a journey point of view, we started on this journey. What we did is we mapped out all the all the possible um, all the possible opportunities that AI could bring us. And I think based on technology now, we're working really hard on it, it being more of an alignment tool and getting rid of getting rid of um, mundane actions, but also, but, but as you can imagine, using the same, it's the same technology as, as we use for autom um, automotive cars, et cetera, uh, autonomous cars. As soon as you train, you train, you train through machine learning, you train them on the system, the components, how they work, what the behavior is, everything that goes into our standards. The more and more it learns, we hope that in the coming, in the coming year or so, we can start talking about how it can help with support for creation. So be able to create journeys, create designs, a, B test, and all sorts of kind of really cool ideas that come out of that. But I don't think it's going to ever take away the, the creative aspect of what we do, but it's definitely going to really turbocharge our ideas. So um, just to kind of finish up, as there's still so much for us to do. And, you know, we're, every time we fix something, a huge challenge comes out of it, something new every day that we're kind of dealing with on a global scale. Um, but really, really excited about how the future holds. And um, thank you for listening.